in the spirit of the the week that we're in with Thanksgiving, just definitely wanted to express gratitude and um, and thanks to to Reese, our guest today, for joining and being willing to to join. Um, he's our third guest in this webinar series, if you want to call it that, out of four. Um, and yeah, all of the guests so far have just been sharing how they've implemented soil changing practices, you know, soil health and regenerative ag. So we're really excited to to get into that. Um, I don't have too much of a, a huge intro for you, Reese, but um, yeah, on, on some of the description there, um, yeah, getting into to regenerative agriculture and, and cover crops using cereal rye, which is probably fairly common, um, but I'm sure you'll get into kind of the nuances of that of everybody's journey is a little bit different, but now you have a diverse um, farm and operation of growing soybeans and alfalfa and, and corn, uh, wheat and um, barley and some other small grains, it sounds like too. Um, and so, yeah, I'll just kind of let you in livestock too as a part of your operation. So I'll let you kind of start sharing about that. Um, and then the only other thing I wanted to share too is uh, one of our at Green Cover, our core values is, is family matters. Um, and so just kind of knowing Reese for a couple years now, I know that's a big part of of his life too, with uh, with his three kids. It's I think his first slide has has the kids on the picture too. So um, just have a lot of respect for you there too, Reese. But um, with yeah, without me rambling any longer, why don't you take it over? Okay, I will share my screen. I should mention Reese is from Columbus, Nebraska, uh, so about central ish Nebraska. Um, so kind of bringing it more central, the, the first week of the, uh, the webinar series was in California. And then last week we went to Virginia and heard Ronnie Knuckles. Um, so today we're keeping a little more central with, with Reese and Nebraska. Yep. Yep. That's right. Thanks, Jake and Jonathan. Um, really uh, thankful to be asked to do one of these presentations. Um, I'd like to start out saying that I don't know everything there is to know or barely even scratching the surface about understanding what actually happens in the soil and how we can really improve it for future generations for the for our boys and the rest of the family and their kids and just for future generations going forward here um that's so those are my two boys on the right and i've actually got a little girl I've got a picture this was taken this fall um it was our house is actually in those trees in the background there um disregard the button weed by our feet we didn't want to get those in the picture and the foxtail in the background but the photographer really uh she said that the view was beautiful and the trees in the background so i went with it <laughs> uh that's my beautiful wife she stays at home with the kids and um doing a really great job with that um, yeah, so starting with the farm, this is the feedlot. This is kind of where everything got started. Uh, my dad, grandpa, and their two brothers uh, started three different feedlots kind of back in the 70s. And uh, my dad kind of took on trucking to start out with and has done a really great job with that. And I farm with my brother, uh, my brother-in-law, and my my uncle Ed and uh, thanks to them they've really opened up to different practices and different ways of thinking and without them I wouldn't be able to do anything that we that we've learned over the years so really wanted to say a big thanks to them during this um, so with feedlot you need a lot of corn before ethanol uh, there was no byproduct, so it was a lot of corn on corn, which requires a lot of sides. So you got a lot of insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, and that's uh, kind of where we're where I was wanting to get away from. Not originally, but uh, I'll kind of go through that later. But so I came, I went to University of Lincoln, and I studied mechanized systems management. Um, kind of nothing. I mean, it's more about systems-based thinking, and I'm trying to in integrate agronomy to that. Also went to YouTube University, and there is just so much information. 
on YouTube or podcasts. Uh, Green Cover has so many great resources. Um, John Kempf, listen to him a lot. A lot of what he is doing is really exciting. It's me really excited about the future of agriculture and where we can be compared to what we have done to the soil. So we, um, we did the corn on corn. And when I first came back, I got them talked into doing uh, cover crop after we chopped some corn silage. And all we did was spread rye on top of the ground. It's probably about 100 pounds and worked it in. And that next year we chopped it in the spring. It did really, really well. I think it was 11 tons to the acre. Um, and that was wet tons. But uh, then we went back in and I think it was around June 1st, planted beans. And those beans, they were just beautiful all year and ended up around 70. So for starting out with cover crop on the first year, it was kind of a, kind of a home run, I guess, if you could put it that way. So, yeah, so the early days of cover crops, um, we had a 20-acre uh, a field, and I, that was it, was, it was the second year that we planted beans into a cover crop. The first year, my brother-in-law was out there without GPS and six-foot-tall rye, and he, he did a good job. He didn't have any markers or anything, and just went back and forth and missed a few spots, but uh, I can't, I can't really blame him for that in the tall rye and it was on dry land and luckily we had a wet year and it all takes management to do it. But on this field, um, I went through, we drilled into there. I remember drilling it with my wife. She was riding with me and it was, it was over my head and I stand about six foot one and we took a picture in there. I couldn't find the picture, but uh, this was in July. It was July 6th. I just looked it up on the in my phone. And what we assume happened is there's a minimum maintenance road that runs right on the north side of this field. And we think that some teenagers went out there and had a Roman candle war. And they burned about a half acre. Uh, I got a call from the neighbor. Oh, your field's on fire. We'll call the, we'll call the fire department. No. Yeah. So it's just one of those things that happens. Uh, we've been fortunate. It hasn't happened since that year as we're trying to keep more residue on top of the ground. Um, you get kind of nervous about this stuff when it gets really dry. It's just something to think about. Yeah, so uh, we have integrated. We, we did some strip cropping with corn and beans, 30 foot of corn, 30 foot of beans there. And we just staggered the populations going in 45, 40, 34 across the middle eight. And we had some actually really good success with that over the years. Uh, this particular field was an organic crop down on some sand and it did really well but just because it was sand, it was a little bit harder to manage. Uh, the first two years, we did it on dry land with conventional, and we were starting to get running into herbicide options. And the rye certainly helped, but we were running into large seeded broadleaves, uh, buttonweed, cockaburr, and then foxtail is starting to sneak in there too. Uh, so we kind of went away from that but uh, had some really good successes on dry land. We're gonna look to implement that more and more as we go along here. Yeah, so we were looking to change the rotation when I got back. So we, we ended up deciding on a corn, corn, soybean rotation on a majority of the, of the farms. And uh, I forgot to mention that year after we spread that rye on that field, we bought a drill that following winter. So we had that drill and we knew that we were gonna need cover crop seeds. So we decided to keep a field of rye. This is actually a field of wheat and I couldn't find a, I probably had some pictures of rye, but I, I like this one with the ladybug in there and then that big, huge worm on that rye. Uh, on that rye root, the Rastafari roots on the 
on the roots there going deep um i think i just pulled that straight out of the ground i probably taken should have taken a shovel out there um yeah so we changed to a corn corn soybean rotation and we also that the year after we bought the drill we bought a strip till machine a gladi coon kraus gladiator so a shank strip till machine and we were running that on the corn on corn acres, mostly in the spring, because we graze cows on the cover crop or on the corn stalks in the fall. And so after a few years of doing that, uh, we were kind of worried about the disturbance going that deep in the spring. We were worrying about a smear layer down in the bottom and maybe some air pockets. So we ended up changing to a Don Pluribus row unit. And not putting any fertilizer on or anything in there just to make a black strip because with the all of the manure that we've had uh, over the years, our P and K levels are uh, they're pretty good. I mean, we are maintaining them for as much as we can. Uh, I'm a really big fan of lower rates of manure application, uh, anywhere from five to ten tons an acre as opposed to 20 to 40 what a lot what we used to be doing i mean we had a con controlled spill coming out the back and it it uh it really made the ground black but uh just because there was so much manure going on the ground right there and we didn't really utilize the nitrogen that we were getting from that we just figured it was all gone because we were leaving it on top of the ground but uh, I'll go more into that later. So in 2019, I had my first boy and sitting there in the delivery room, I think I think that's kind of when everything really started to change. Um, we, I didn't want to be around the seed treatments and all that stuff, even though I still am on the conventional side, but I'm, we're trying to get more and more away from that. And when, it, when you look to the future to try to guess what's going to happen, I think that there's more and more people that want to get away from that. So on the transition years, uh, this was one field that we had corn in the previous year, combined the corn, planted rye, and then we actually bailed the rye off of it, applied six ton of beef feedlot manure onto there. Excuse me. And then we planted a warm season grazing mix, so mostly sorghum sedan, sunflowers, sun hemp, uh, collards, turnips. Uh, there was a uh, soybeans, just a whole bunch of a uh, whole bunch of warm seed, warm season stuff that uh, we initially planned on grazing earlier but you can tell here that it's it's getting pretty late into the fall i think it was uh middle of september before we got to this um we had we had about 10 acre strips that i just went through and uh shredded off to make the fences and on this field there was supposed to be a frost coming through and i brother and my dad were really concerned about prussic acid poisoning. I mean, I was, I was really scared about it too. So me and my brother went out there on four wheelers and we tried to chase them back onto stuff that they have a graze. We were just gonna keep them off of there and feed them for a few days, but they wouldn't come off, wouldn't come off. It started getting dark. And uh, we ended up just turning them out on a new piece and we never had any problems with the prussic acid poisoning. So I think there was enough diversity there that uh, we didn't have to worry about any of that. So, um, yeah, this is the steers going into there. It's pretty nerve wracking, this, this whole thing, because we were right along a, a pretty main road, a, a paved road. And we put that new high tensile fence. I guess you can see it there. Now the ground was, ground is all bare under there. Um, yeah, turned them out into there. And so that year we were planning, or we we did all that. 
didn't plant anything into there in the fall. We thought we'd get some more regrowth, but it ended up turning colder a little bit earlier than we planned on. And so that next year it was, you could, the guy that lives there, he said, you could see a rabbit run one from one end of the field to the other. So we were a little too bare from what, uh, from what we wanted to be, but that next year was transition year for corn and we didn't apply. All we did was put on some a bio coat gold from advancing eco ag. And then we did a soil primer actually in the fall before the corn. And we worked the ground. I think I hit it twice with the disc disc and then planted the corn rotary hoed once cultivated once. And that was it. And then went up there and I took some uh, sap analysis and it called for a little bit of molybdenum, boron. I can't remember exactly what it was, what else it was, but we applied that. It was right around tassel time. We put that through the pivot, ran the pivot and TNL pivot as fast as it can go. And you know how fast those things can go, being from Hastings. It isn't really fast. So we probably over applied too much, but uh, we ended up chopping that field of corn and we got 25 ton to the acre. And when they appraised it, they appraised it at 207 and that's with no nitrogen or anything else. The only thing we didn't apply any manure besides before that six tons of manure before the, before the cover crop. So we really considered that a huge success. I didn't really see too much, any nitrogen deficiency in the corn at all, no leaf firing towards the bottom. And it really blew my mind. It really made me question everything. Like, why do we have to apply 200 pounds of nitrogen to get 200? Why does it have to be a one-to-one -one ratio when we didn't put anything on this? And I think the grazing had something to do with it too. And haven't really figured it all out yet, but the plan was to go, that was the second year transition. Third year was going to be roller crimped rye. And we didn't have it set up right. So we didn't do a, what they really say is to do three bushel. I think we only did a hundred pounds and they say get all, all of one variety and we just did VNS. So there was a few things that were working against us. And since we didn't apply any nitrogen, I think we were we were really short on nitrogen on that rye crop. Uh, didn't have the leaf mass on there. You can't really tell from the picture. I wish I would have taken a better one viewing the whole field, but I went out there with the crimper that we borrowed from uh, another organic guy in the area. And I made one time around the field and I said, this isn't going to work where it's popping back up. Even if I hit it twice, I tried going the other way and thank the Lord, I didn't plant into boot stage on the rye and then come back and crimp. Like I was thinking about doing it. And we ended up turning lemonade into lemons. And I called my dad as I was in the field. I said, what are we going to do with this? And he's like, well, we can, we can chop it. I think, uh, I think one of our neighbors needs some more feed. I said, well, well, that would be great. And I can't, I don't think I can work this in, <laughs> into the ground and try to get a good stand of beans and try to cultivate through all of that. So we chopped it. I think it was like four or five tons. It wasn't a whole lot, but uh, it ended up paying for a lot of what we needed to do and planted the beans on there. Kind of struggled. Um, I guess the year before we had really good beans, really clean organic beans, uh, rotary hoed them three times and that kind of ruined me. I thought, uh, wow, this, this is easy. I mean, I'm going to grow more beans. I barely put anything into them and we got like 65 bushel beans and I was just all pumped about it. So we tried to scale that up a little more and, uh, uh, yeah, it was, uh, one of those really, uh, learning moments for um because i think that it was hard to look at every year like i said it was on a paved road uh the water hemp got about five foot tall i was looking for rogers to come in 
and I just couldn't get them because they were busy because that year the beans were worth 40 30 to 40 dollars and everybody had beans and it was just a it was just a really tough year but they ended up doing 45 somewhere around there and it all things considered it it turned out really well but I think with uh with the grazing that is kind of where we want to be able to go so on these are just two random pictures that I found in my phone. Um, I used to see garden spiders all the time in just around the farm and everywhere. And I noticed I, I haven't seen them, but when I walk into this particular field, it's just loaded with them. And the only time I ever see them is on organic fields anymore. So I don't, I don't know if it's the neonicotinoids that are, uh, causing issues with that, or I just don't know if there's other knock-on um, effects from a lot of the herbicides and all of the chemicals that we put on every, most acres every year. Um, yeah, here's uh, another picture I took this year of the garden spider and that blooming flower over there. If anybody's ever seen a collar to make it through the winter, that's what it looks like. It gets about five feet tall. It looks like canola, kind of. Excuse me. But uh, that was another way that we transitioned. Uh, we did, we took, we chopped rye off and then worked it once and worked the corn stalks once, or um, the rye in and planted alfalfa into there. And that is one pound of collard that made it through the winter. And you can see some sand foin. And uh, I thought I had some chicory on there too, but uh, yeah, those two are, chicory is one of my favorite plants to, because if you ever try to dig up a chicory root, you, there's no way you ever get to the bottom of it. And the blooms are just beautiful. Um, and not to mention it's a non-bloater or it has tannins in it. So if you have extra clover in there, it really helps with that. Okay, so on a different field that we transitioned, we started with wheat. Well, we chopped the corn off and went and sprayed on the soil primer mix that comes from AEA and planted the, the wheat. And we got a great stand. I mean, it looked beautiful all year. And then we uh, we actually drilled in clover over top of the rye as early in the spring as we could go um, after the ground was thawed out. And after we took off the wheat, it we didn't think we had a good enough stand of clover there to be able to keep the weeds out of it or to get a cutting or anything. So we drilled a warm season grazing mix into that after the wheat. And it was, it was just amazing how much everything grows during the summer. So here is the same picture that the one with the four wheeler is a little bit earlier on than the other one. Um, and you can see how it kind of goes through waves through there where we weren't really sure why the the clover because the darker green is the clover and the lighter is the sorghum and the sunflower sticking up out of there i mean there's a few we weeds that you can see through there with the pigweed but look at all that cow feed i want to say that picture was taken in september sometime and then so we ended up grazing 70 cows on that field it was about 90 acres and they were on there for three months I think and they I mean they grazed it to the ground but they they trampled enough it was great ground cover on there the ground was froze for the most part most of the year and then that next year this is what the yellow sweet clover looked like I mean that was chest high and there was red clover alfalfa all mixed in there we were kind of blown away at how much, how great everything grew. Um, we didn't think we had a good enough stand and then we get all this. And so we were short on feed again that year. Uh, maybe not short, but uh, we were trying to 
figure out how to make this profitable. And so we ended up chopping that field too. And we planted, this was year two of the transition. And we ended up chopping that, working it, and then planting corn into there. I think it was June 15th that we finally got it put in. Um, yeah, that, that corn that we did, it we ended up chopping that and tried to do the the rye roller crimp thing that we did on that other field, but we ended up, we were short on feed, so we chopped that off. But the corn did, I think it was close to 20 to 25 ton, no nitrogen, 210 is what the appraiser said. And so then my mind just really keeps going, keeps going. Um, this is another field that we had a different way of transitioning. Uh, this was oats originally that we were growing for green cover. Um, they were Hayden oats and we seeded red clover with them. And uh, the red clover, we didn't think looked good. So we drilled another thing into there and this is what it looked like uh, earlier or that next spring. So clover can be kind of sneaky. You got to really look for it. And it, some I don't know if it has like hard seed that it delays its uh, germination, but you just want to be patient with it. Okay, switching topics on to um, some 60 inch corn. So this guy, he was probably planting 40 inch, 40 inch corn. Um, I don't know where I got the picture. I saw it on my phone and it, it just really got me excited again. So there's really nothing new that any of us are ever going to do with cover crops that hasn't been thought about in the past before. It's just now we have the technology and the resources to get these mixes and be able to use them on a precision agriculture basis to to be able to use more nutrient or to utilize what's in the ground and utilize that microbiology that's there to work for us and with us and to just to create more life in that soil. Uh, so yeah, we did the 60 inch corn uh, and what's down in there, you can see, I think we had a pound of a pumpkin mix um yeah there was a pound of pumpkins a lot of you can see the cowpeas climbing up i mean they're dang near up on top of the tassels yeah. and uh the clo or collards man they're they're just huge down in there they i mean you can they can take up to the mid-teens on the when it comes to frost so they stayed green and uh yeah, the the yield hit on there was a little bit more than what we were doing, than what we would like to have, but uh, it was probably around 10 to 12 percent loss. And when did you plant those cover crops into the rows? Um, well, it was, it was probably around V5, maybe V6. We were getting a little too late um, mm -hmm. on some of it. We had a, a a we have a drill that's set up to go in between there and maybe we were uh, knocking a few of the corn over a little a few of the corn stalks over when we were going through um yeah so i wanted to scale it over to the organic and uh so this is me ridging up that organic corn on 60 inch rows uh we did it on about seven or eight acres this year to see if we could uh, plant the corn and then this year and then just do corn on corn, just moving back and forth over because we would have enough of a different crop with legumes. And we tried to get um, hairy vetch and cowpeas and some sun hemp and annual ryegrass all established on there for grazing and for next year's corn. So what happened was that corn, this is, uh, the left picture is the 60 inch corn and it's canopied. Those leaves are crossing over each other. I think I took that right around the middle of the day 
that is all the light that was going down in there. So I can't express enough how important hybrid selection is if you're going to try 60 inch row or maybe low pop, low population corn. Um, we picked the wrong one here, but uh, it ended up the 60s didn't do any worse than the 30 inch corn on the organic side. So that was something that we learned but uh, we didn't get a whole lot of growth out of, uh, I mean, you can see some of the radishes that made it through that are laying down in there. And then by the time we got to it, combining wise, there wasn't, uh, there wasn't much left to go through there. So this is a video of me planting through there with that drill. It just happens that crust buster, everything's set on five foot centers which is 60 foot. So it worked out to get that set up that way. It was a 10 inch. And then we just slid the row units into eight inch spacing and there's a 20 inch gap for the corn to run through there. Really thought that we would be doing a lot more of that, but uh, kind of scaling it back a little bit again, just because of that yield hit and not knowing what hybrids to do that on or which ones to pick. So on the right side where the, you can see the little tiny clovers coming up, that was in that field of wheat. Um, anytime we plant wheat or any small grain, we're gonna try to get a clover established in there because those root systems are amazing and the weed control and the grazing. I mean, there's just so many benefits of the compound on themselves. And dad talks about how he went, he remembers going out there with oats and, uh, spreading on yellow sweet clover and then plowing that in and he's like well what you're doing isn't really new and mm -hmm. it's just what our grandparents used to do so the picture with the disc on there is uh it's a little bit earlier than what i'd like to hit the the green manure i guess um i'd really like to get everything think like you're feeding a ruminant when you're think when you're thinking about feeding the soil i uh, got that from Gary Zimmer, another great one to follow. Um, he, uh, or we work that in and then we're coming back in. Anytime we work ground, we're trying to do it with a purpose. And as much as I don't like doing it, it seems to not have affected our organic matter levels yet. Um, that's still something that's out there for um, debate, I guess. But uh, anytime we can keep it covered, keep something on there. If we're keep, I mean, we've got about two weeks before something, before the corn is coming up. And then once that corn comes up, I mean, those roots go down there and, and every anything is about the roots. I mean, it doesn't matter what it looks like on top of the ground. Residue is super important. But if you can get that soil covered in the heat of the summer, that is what the, the main thing is. So we are, uh, we planted some trees in 2020 and uh, they, I found this picture of, I think it was from the 1930s and 40s where it's got the picture on the right of the, of the dust bowl with the no trees and I, I really think perennial crops and uh, perennial, perennial tree crops and or perennial, um, not only cover crops, but grazing crops will be in the future for my kids. Just for, there's a whole list of reasons why it could be that, but um, we need to figure out a way as farmers to be able to get there without having to have, do so much to the ground. I mean, one of the things I've heard talked about was uh, our pastures are kind of the low hanging fruit because pasture management hasn't changed in the last 120 years ever since barbed wire was invented. Um, it's usually set stock grazing. You turn them out there and you say, here you go cows, go figure it out, go fill your bellies up and graze whatever you can. It hasn't the management hasn't changed and and you compare that to corn and 
how much corn management has changed throughout the years. It just, uh, it's really there to make a, to make a guy think about where the future is going and how can we limit our inputs to be able to go through, if we do go through another economic downturn, the corn goes down to $2 or $3 or ethanol goes away, or I don't know anything that the consumer might not like with, uh, with some of the practices we're doing. Um, this is a picture of, uh, this is this fall. It kind of, uh, is we tried to, um, redo what we did with that wheat, except last year we had all of our winter wheat, winter kale, uh, besides some dryland corners, but it was still a pretty wimpy stand. So I had already frosted the clover into the wheat, thinking that it was just down there and it was going to come up. And so we ended up drilling oats into there. And we took bales off, got a lot of bales. I think it was four bales to the acre of oats. And uh, then we came back got them moved off, went in with that warm season grazing mix, and it got about chest high, maybe a little taller, and we windrowed that and chopped it. And this is actually the regrowth after we chopped it. And we've got cows out there now, that clover's about knee high. You can see the, the collards and everything. I'm not sure why the picture's so grainy, but yeah, the cows are, you can see them up there in the top left corner. Um, that's a great way to feed your cows and feed your soil all at once. So on the wheat side of things, we're trying to do about 90 to 100 pounds of wheat planted in the middle of September. So by doing that, we're going with a lot of early variety soybeans. Um, we were doing some one eights this year, one eight to two, three is kind of the max. I'm wanting to get them out that first part of October. I really want to get them out in September, um, to get that growth on, because I've heard it said before that a, a day in September is worth a week in October. And then a, how do they say it? A day or a week in October is worth the whole month of November for for growing degree days. Yeah. Um, so a half pound of turnips, half pound of radish goes a long ways with anything. There's like 300,000 seeds per acre. Um, the middle picture is 25 pounds of rye. So you can cover a lot of acres with the drill and still get a good stand. These were taken in, uh, I think it was a end of October, right before it froze and it ended up, it did kill a lot of those well, it burned off the leaves on a lot of those turnips and radishes, but they're still alive. They're trying to stick new shoots out, but they're not quite there yet. And I don't know how much more they'll do. I was hoping for more of a, if we wouldn't have got that warm spell, I think we could have got so much more growth and so much more uh, root growth on that. The far right picture is after we chopped, we put in, uh, I think it was 70 pounds of rye and 15 pounds of vetch and a pound or two of collards and uh, turnips. You can see the turnip leaves are burnt off. I mean, there's one here, one there, but that vetch is really, you can't really see it when you go and look in the field, but you take a shovel out there and you dig it up and that's the right picture. You can see the nodules on the, on the bottom right side of that picture. And they're just huge. Um, that cornfield that we applied, I think it was 125 pounds of nitrogen total uh, of synthetic, I should say. Mm -hmm. And we've had previous manure history, so we use that too. Excuse me. And um, so, and we got, I think it was 270 bushel of corn on there. So we know that we're short of nitrogen on there. So learning from that one year, over on that farm where the rye didn't have enough leaves. We're putting the vetch in there to help make more nitrogen. It might not share it that first year or right away, but it's going to 
leave more microbes in there, more biomass in the soil. And uh, on top of the ground, if the rye only gets two foot tall because it's nitrogen deficient, then we'll have all the vetch there to take and fill that void for, so we're not short on feed. Um, I took this picture. It looks like I still had oats in the field. Uh, they it must have been right before we went through and baled the oats. So it was probably in the middle of June, closer to July, middle of June probably. And that's the yellow sweet clover root. And it's probably got about a foot of growth on it already. And I was just digging up some um, soil probes soil moisture probes the other day and I happened to run across one of those roots and it was as big as my pinky and I didn't have a shovel with me but I tried to pull it out with my pliers and I just broke it off right at the top so I don't know how deep they go but that is an awesome 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 plant to get in the ground to get down there and break that compaction layer up okay on to the the nitrogen side of things on the conventional. So after we had that, that really, those two really awesome years of corn with no nitrogen, everything, I listened to John Kempf more and more and a pound of nitrogen is not equal to a pound of nitrogen. So the most effective is amino acid form. And then it goes down from there, from um, urea to ammonium and then nitrate is the least efficient form of nitrogen. And previously we had been applying all nitrate, 32%. I mean, there's a little bit of ammonium in there in the 32, but uh, we never put a carbon source in there to try to tie it up. And uh, so we did the First year we did the nitrogen program on the corn. It uh, We put on 80 pounds of nitrogen and we added humicarb, which is a humic acid, but it also has a human portion in it. So it ties on to the anions. And, uh, and then we put a little rejuvenate in there, which is a carbohydrate source. And then molybdenum, which is key for the plant to be more efficient with nitrate because of the nitri nitrate reductase enzyme. Um, we did all this on a couple different fields and we did some higher nitrogen checks right next to it. And it was 80 pounds, it was on bean ground. We spread, I think it was 10 <coughs> tons of nitrogen or 10 tons of feedlot manure on there and uh, ended up 50 bushel with 85 pounds applied and, uh, and that was all through the pivot nothing goes on up front for us we're using so I should talk about this graph a little bit so at the veg vegetative stage down at the bottom of the screen you can see 369 and and the graph is the nitrogen uptake so at v6 it starts to ramp up and at nine, you're about halfway there. And then so from B9 up to tassel, I, I've read somewhere it takes up like seven pounds of nitrogen per day. So on the organic stuff, where is that coming from? Is it coming from the organic source? Is it coming from a bacillus subtilis, something that produces nitrogen um, in the soil? I mean, you hear about there's a lot of uh, a lot of different companies that are pushing their own biological look, and they have a lot of the same strains, but it's all about how you apply it and how you can make it work on your farm. I really think that it's important to get that corn in the ground and almost have it in a nitrogen deficient, but not overly nitrogen deficient, like into six foot tall rye because then you can really run into problems because it thinks that there's nothing there. Mm -hmm. But if you have a little bit of nitrogen, but you don't need to apply anything because there's already enough organic matter that's producing that right away to start with. Um, yeah, put 
and then put a uh, biological in furrow with no fertilizer, water, probably a carbohydrate source. And we're using um, a soil primer um, that has really worked for us. We're using it on corn and beans in furrow right on the seed. That's the greatest point of influence that you can have on any annual plant or any perennial plant for that matter, I guess. But yeah, we've we've seen some huge benefits of, uh, of applying less nitrogen and we're gonna try to cut it back, but we have, okay, so I should say, we have had some issues where we have been a little bit low on nitrogen and I haven't been able to really pinpoint exactly what it is, but I think it's mostly manure history and grazing history that, because on a soil test, you can't, you can't tell there's, I, they look nearly identical on a soil test. We did a Haney test on them too. Uh, they called for the same amount of nitrogen, but you could go out there and visibly see that it was nitrogen deficient in one field same program all went through the pivot um and the other field it was perfectly green uh there's some things that i don't understand how it works um i'm le always learning uh, along the way um yeah so that's kind of our nitrogen program and mm -hmm. then so life compounds on itself and we can be co-creators with God to create abundant life on our farms and our communities. And I got a picture of my boy there. We were uh, windrowing that, that tall vetch there. And as I was windrowing it, I asked him, what are, what are we windrowing here? And he couldn't say too many words, but there was a yellow mustard plant right in front of me. And he said, mustard. So <laughs> I think our kids are there to humble us and tell us what's uh, just just to help us focus on what is really important. And I guess that's kind of it for my mm -hmm. presentation there. Well, that's really great. Yeah, thanks for sharing all that info and, and journey that you had there, with the things you're doing, Reese. Um, real quick, that would be all of the vets you talked about, I assume to be hairy vetch. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And hairy vetch would be the most cool tolerant vetch is the most commonly used, especially for fall planting has a really high cold tolerance, um, can survive the winter and fix a lot of nitrogen. That was really impressive nodulation on those, those hairy vetch a few slides ago that didn't have much above ground growth. That was, that was quite impressive. I thought. Yeah. No, I mean, I didn't have a shovel with me. I pulled that out my hand. Yeah. I wish yeah. I had a shovel. See how deep they really went. And then on the clovers, a couple of times you're talking about those. I like what you said. They, they can certainly be sneaky. I mean, sometimes they get maybe downplayed even by myself. And sometimes how I think of them, they're not always the most impressive growth, but then they're just kind of always there. Um, I shouldn't say always, but I mean, they'll be there more than you think oftentimes. Um, can you talk a little bit about red clover um, and then also the yellow sweet clover? I think I think those are the main two that you've used or talked about today and just the differences and scenarios you'd use those. Yeah, um, on the wheat, I guess um, I always like to have them in a mix. Um, yellow, or, yeah, the yellow sweet clover, red clover, uh, some common alfalfa, and then all side clover for the low lying ground if we got any water holes or something like that. Mm -hmm. And usually if you can have one of those four, they one of them is going to take off in a certain spot. Diversity always trumps intensity. Um, we've, on the yellow sweet clover, there's been years that it does awesome, and I don't know why. And then we've had other years, like this year, we blend, drilled it with the oats and it just didn't didn't really take off like it did. We've had you know some clover where it's taller than the oats when we're going through to combine it. It's like, oh shoot, how are we gonna run all this through the combine? And then this last year, it just didn't really do a whole lot. So 
I don't know if there could have been some residual herbicide in soil there or something like that, but mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. yeah, red clover, it's, it's not quite as robust as alfalfa or yellow sleep clover in that first year, but that second year it can, we've, we grazed that, that one crop of yellow sweet clover. We've had cows out there pretty much all year and we actually had to go out there and chop some of it because we couldn't keep enough cows on there because it yeah. just keeps coming. As long as you're moving them across the field, giving it, allowing enough time for regrowth, it just keeps going. It's, it's really an amazing crop. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, speaking a little bit to what you said about the perennials and stuff, that's just it kind of a little bit of an untapped thing, not completely, but not as much tapped into in the cover crop world as the perennials. I think that has huge part of the future. Uh, yes. Speaking of cattle, and I had this question, but um, Mike Rice put it in the Q&A as well. Like he says, how important is grazing cattle in your system? And then just maybe fill in some context. Like, do you have areas you don't graze? What percentage of your row crop do you graze? So we were talking about it a little earlier uh, before we actually went live. I wish we had more contiguous acres that we could just run the cows right over to the pasture, or right back. We have some of those. Uh, sometimes logistics just doesn't allow for enough time to be able to move the cattle like that. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like it to become a lot bigger part of our crops and rotation just because of the benefits we've seen. But it can get... You can run into some issues if it gets wet, you get some pugging going on there, and then you got to come in and reseed that or work it down or something like that. Um, it's certainly a challenge that I don't think there's any one way to manage through it. It's it's really hard to do, I guess. Kind of goes back to that sixth principle or maybe first principle of soil health, the context of, you know, yeah, exactly. integrating livestock and, you know, that's a principle of soil health and can be really, really beneficial for improving soil, but it doesn't make sense in every single scenario or every single acre um, all the time. So that makes sense. Um, we had a couple questions or maybe just this question on, on manure. Uh, how do you manage the manure in terms of making sure it has good biology? And then also do the cattle get dewormer and antibiotics which ne negatively impact the soil or soil biology yes the ones that the ones that i all had yes they all get ivermectin uh, um yeah that it's not good for dung beetles i've got a few cows here at home and uh we don't do any of that on and they we see dung i mean you can look in the patties and it's it's amazing how, how much they come in once you stop using that stuff. Hmm. Uh, what was the first part of the question? Uh, just how do you manage the manure in terms of making sure right. it has the biology? Um, we don't really manage it too much. I guess we're scraping it out of the pen. And uh, I I think of more manure as more of a microbial catalyst and uh, then a nitrogen source. Uh it's That's kind a of little hard to... on your end because you know where it's coming from too. I mean, it's your own mm -hmm. feedlot, so. Right. Yeah, we try not to do any of the settling basins. We try to keep the weed seeds out of, out of most of it. And if we do do settling basins, it'll go on to conventional ground that we because there'll be plenty of kochia and mm -hmm. uh, water hemp and everything going through there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Uh, here's a good question. Just talk about kind of your practice of applying some of these biologicals or some of the products from AEA. Um, so this one says, do you do a biological seed coating before planting? Um, and I guess take that wherever you want of just like, have you used any of those products applied to the seed beforehand or just right at planting? What have you seen, you know, from that? Yeah, I should have said that. Every seed that goes into the ground on the farm gets covered with bioco gold, and I make the, make sure that's a uh, that's a priority whenever it goes in the ground. It might take a little bit more time, but uh, yeah, it's we've seen the benefits. Then you get those 
those thick hairs, those dreadlocks on the roots right away coming out of the ground. It's it's just amazing how uh, how such a small amount can go such a long ways. Yeah, because some of those, I mean, some inoculants are by ounce or by pound. I mean, it's a pretty heavy application rate. Some of these, like the BioCoat Gold or some of the other ones out there, a mycorrhizal fungi inoculant, I mean, we measure that in grams and it's only a few grams per acre or a few hundred pounds. And it's, it's kind of amazing how it kind of messes with your mind of like, how does that even get applied to the whole acre? But it really does. You can see the, the results oftentimes. Yes. Oh, um, yeah. Um, let's see. Here's one. Has there been any thought to changing to short corn and maybe that was i think we were talking about the 60 inch corn or the different varieties as well um um from what i've heard about short corn it still creates just as big of a can canopy sometimes even thicker because those nodes are just stacked on there so close i've never seen it so mm -hmm. yeah that that could very well be an option um I think uh, there's a couple people on Twitter, um, Bob Recker, Lawrence Dianlogi. I don't know if he's doing much this year with it, but there's lots of people that are trying to do it. Junior uh, PF Sansel or something like that. He's He's got a lot of data on it. Um, you can look him up on Twitter um, for, for yield, for hybrids and yields. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but yeah there's a lot more research to be done on that to be able to make it work yeah no that's good um as we transition just to to one o'clock um the audience if you're okay with it we'll go a couple more minutes or five more minutes maybe and answer some other questions um so just kind of laying that out there um one of the questions i have is just kind of what has been well, from the time you first started, maybe going down more regenerative path, what were some of your main soil health goals? And then I'd be curious to know kind of how have those changed over time to now? Right. So in college, I guess I didn't go through this. Um, I really started looking into cover crops, how we can graze them. And I remember vividly somebody came up to me and it was Tyler Dahlgren. We were in the hallway and said, have you ever heard of Gabe Brown? What you're what he you're looking into doing is what he's doing. And so I think everybody goes down the Gabe Brown rabbit hole. Um, really wanted to do that starting out. Um, didn't do that because of where we were located and how we were set up to do things initially. Yeah, one kind of closing thought too, to close out. But um, yeah, I don't know. Were you Sorry. finishing a thought there on the the goals or <laughs> the last question I asked. Yeah, I'm wanting to integrate more perennials into everything. I think they have a really nice fit for um, even on the conventional ground to run as like uh, a companion. There's some really interesting um, guy, Frederick Larson. I think he's over in the Netherlands. I'm not sure, but he's running a perennial. Uh, alfalfa and knocking it back with Roundup with low applications of Roundup and keeping that deep root in there. And I, that is one place that I really want to get into, but mm -hmm. first things first. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and maybe with some of what you've already shared answers the first part of this question, which is, do you feel optimistic about the future of farming and the more so why would that be? Oh yeah, very, very optimistic about it. I think we're just starting to get into understanding a tiny little bit of the biology and how it's actually working in the soil and what we can do to, uh, to influence that biology in a positive way to be able to actually change soils and rebuild them back up to the prairie levels that we were at before, four to eight, 10% organic matter, but uh, we've got a long, long, long ways to go on that. Mm. And that's mm. exciting. It's something to look forward yeah. over the next 40 years of farming or however many I got left. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we can close with my last question and then give you the chance to share anything else you would like to, but you mentioned uh, 
like John Kempf and some of his resources? What's just a couple, either like a, a book or two or a podcast um, that would just like recommend to one of your favorites to learn and, you know, for resources other than, you know, Green Cover's website and YouTube channel? <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um... One that I really like to listen to is Graham Sate, uh, Nutrition Farming or Nutrition Rules or something like that. It's a podcast. It's a longer version podcast. I think it's usually like three hours, but he's got some humor in there and just a lot of really good stuff. He's down in Australia, uh, which and they have those younger soils and they need to be able to start to build those soils up. We're blessed with um, really great soils around here yeah um uh let's see gary zimmer ag talk okay new ag talk for sure shout mm -hmm. out to bob c bless me no farm lauren um all of them guys have really helped me learn how to start with organic and the amount of resources that are out there you'll never be able to consume it all but uh yeah, that, those are pretty much main things, I guess. Awesome. Yeah, that's great. Um, and then, yeah, in closing, any just last final thoughts or anything you would like to to plug or to say? Um, no, just enjoy your family this Thanksgiving. Um, yeah, that's that's what it's all about. Excellent. Well, thanks again, Reese. Can't thank you enough for joining and, and sharing your perspective and your knowledge with us. So. Appreciate it. Yes, thank you for having me. Absolutely, so anytime. Oh. Sorry, I got a little long-winded on that. I, presentation hey, went longer than I thought. <laughs> no, that's good. I uh, loved all the slides there, so good work putting that together. Okay, thanks, Jacob. All right, you bet. Thanks, Jonathan.